Yeah, we're so grateful for the dads who just want to um, show the kind of love and respect to their daughters that will help them make really wise choices all of their lives. We think that's a great thing. There's someone I'd like to introduce you to this morning. His name is Michael Luciano, and uh, he's involved in a ministry that uh, probably most of us would try to avoid. And yet, uh, God called him to it, and not only is he making a huge difference in the ministry he's doing, he's also experiencing a huge difference that God is making in him while he's doing it. So would you please give a warm welcome to Michael Luciano this morning. Good morning. Thank you very much. So, you, what is your ministry? What do you do? So, I'm a, uh, my name is Michael Luciano. I'm a proud member of the Reach Out and Touch prison ministry. The Reach Out and Touch prison ministry um, has been operating and serving the incarcerated population of Rikers Island for the last 22 years. Um, we serve Rikers Island, and through letters and correspondence and through the relationships we establish there, we're also you know, actively ministering to individuals through all of the upstate um, prisons. Um, I know I'm not... I'm from Long Island, so everything outside of Long Island is upstate for us. So I got <laughs> chastised by Pastor Greg last week. I got chastised by him. But you guys are really upstate, so I, I, think, I think we're safe. We, we really are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, tell us a little bit about Rikers Island. What, what kind of uh, inmate population exists there? What, what, you know, how many people go through that in a year, that kind of thing? Sure. Well, Rikers Island, it's a, it's a notorious jail. It's called the worst jail in America. You guys are more or less familiar about it. Right? You, you see it in the press. It's pretty topical right now. There's about 10, depending on what you, you, who you're talking to, there's somewhere between eight and 10,000 people, inmates, on Rikers Island um, every single day. There's 10 facilities on the island. It's not just one huge facility, but there's 10 facilities. Um, and they each have a different need. Some are for those dealing with drug addiction. There's a female facility. There's a gang facility, which we're happy to go to. There's segregated population. So there's a variety of populations on the island. Um, it's, it's, it, there's, a high, there's a super high churn that goes through Rikers Island. So of those 10,000 people, um, greater than 50% of them are only there for seven days. Um, so it's a, it's a concophony of, of human life. Um, but that's where God's people are. That's where they are. Yeah. So how, you folks wouldn't know this, but his day job is a corporate executive guy. So how does a corporate executive guy wind up doing prison ministry on Rikers Island, which is considered the worst jail in America? It's, uh, it's, not, it's not the choice that I would have made for myself um, if, if, I was, if it was just left up to me. But thank God, God knows what he's doing. Um, but no, I, I never had any intentions of you know, serving in prison. I really had no intentions of serving God, to, to be honest with you. Um, but through a variety of events, um, you know, I, I, as I was chasing Jesus, as my wife, you know, those women out there keep praying for your husbands, keep, keep praying for your sons. But, uh, you know, my wife was praying for me. She ended up taking me to church. Um, and I ended up getting into a pretty comfortable position in, in church um, and to the point where I was asked to speak at a men's retreat. I'm speaking um, at a men's retreat up at Tuscarora Inn for Bethpage. Um, and I'm preaching on the... the uh, I was always very fascinated by how the Old Testament prophets would respond when God called them. All right, you guys, what, what would they say? No, not me. No, here I am. Right, actually the opposite. They say, here I am. God calls, and all the Old Testament prophets would say, here I am. So here I am writing this, um, this, this sermon because I think I'm answering the call. Right, but I'm really just serving out of my own convenience. Right, I was, I was an usher. I was a deacon. I was the treasurer. But it was all on my terms. So here I am writing, I'm sharing my faith, and I'm, I'm writing a sermon about here I am, which is basically just celebrating how great I am. Okay, that's my sermon. And God being God, you know, he had, he had a little surprise to me. So I receive, as I'm writing the sermon, I'm not done, I, I receive a text, an email from a woman that I know from Texas, a pastor's wife that I know from Texas, um, asking me if I could visit a, a young man who was uh, in their youth group years and years ago who is currently um, incarcerated in the Manhattan Detention Center in downtown New York. Now, I, I don't know if you guys know this, but the Manhattan Detention Center is also known as the Tombs. Okay, so I got an email to go visit the Tombs. And I immediately marked the email as unread, and my mind is racing, how do I get out of this? Right, how do I get out of this? 
because I, I don't want to go. I'm scared out of my mind, right? Anybody else have a, a rational fear of, of prison? Who wants to go to prison? I don't want to go. And I'm even more so because I'm like emotionally scarred from Scared Straight. You know, the older folks, with, you remember Scared Straight? Like the first one that came out, not the loop on the A&E channel, but the, the real original one. It was scary and I was scarred. So I'm thinking <laughs> maybe, like maybe I can injure myself so I don't have to go to prison, <laughs> right? That's how, that's how scared I was. Um, I called my pastor, you know, Pastor Sal on, on Long Island, and I'm like, listen, pastor, they asked me to go to prison, man, what should I do? And he's like, oh, Michael, it's a very, very, you know, dark place, and I'm like, liking the way this is going. And then he says, but I think you can do it. And I'm like, oh. So, you know, so I asked God for a confirmation, um, and he gave me like six. <laughs> right? Because right? like, I'm a rockhead, I, I just, I, I need it. Um, and look, and how can I not go? I'm writing a sermon on here I am, right, responding to God's call. So if I don't go, I'm a hypocrite. And I can be a lot of things in this life, but I can't, I can't be a hypocrite. So I go. I'm afraid. I'm crying. My wife's holding me like a little baby. I'm, I'm not exaggerating. I'm not embellishing. I'm crying. So I take the subway downtown, and I, and I get off um, near the courts. It's all, the whole court system is down there. And I ask the police for directions. And I can't speak because my tongue is stuck to the roof of my mouth. Um, and they're laughing at me. You know, they're just laughing at me. This is real funny. And so I walk up the street. And I'll never forget this for, for my entire life. I walk up the street. And I touch the doors of the Manhattan Detention Center. I touch the doors of the tombs. I touch the doors of the place where all the dead bones are. You guys know the Wizard of Oz? Right? Remember the Wizard of Oz? Right? First 15 minutes when they're in Kansas, it's all black and white. Right? And then they hit Oz. She hits Oz. And it all bursts into this amazing technicolor. Right? In my life, when I touch those doors... My life turned from black and white to this amazing technicolor. And I, I saw the world like I've never seen it before. And I saw it God's people like I've never saw them before. And I stepped out of the plan. You know, I stepped into God's plan for my life, right? I stepped out of my plan for my life. And I stepped into God's plan for my life. And actually, I stepped out of my plan for God's plan for my life. <laughs> Right? Anybody else who does that? Right? It's like, God, this is my plan. No, man, I stepped out of my plan for God's plan for my life, and I stepped into his plan. And I thank him every single day that he sends me to the worst place on earth. So, so yeah. Let's... So I'm sure you have lots of stories about how People's lives have been influenced by grace in environments like that. What has that done? I mean, what has that done to you? How has that changed you? Because obviously God is changing them. What is God doing in you? Well, you know, it's, it's amazing. It, it's impossible. Well, first, first off, what, what God revealed in me was this tremendous love. This tremendous love. And for others. Right? Because up until that point, I had a tremendous love for myself. Like Olympic level, like gold medal <laughs> level, right? Topical. And if I had anything left over, I could give it to my family. But he, he released, you know, through sending me here, he released this amazing love in me for these men and for these women. So now how can I go home and not love my family the same way? How can I go home if I, if I spent that day sitting across from a man or a woman who is convicted of some heinous things and say, no, but Jesus loves you and there's mercy and there's forgiveness and there's hope, right? And it doesn't end here for you. And then go home and not provide my family with the same amount of love and mercy and, and forgiveness. So it's changed me um, yeah. irrevocably um, for the better. You know, it was a low bar to start with, so I'm just, you know, it's all <laughs> incremental, but yeah. I'm better than I was, that's for yeah. sure. So, um, the number of people incarcerated in the United States is a phenomenal number. The number of people who are arrested annually in the United States is a phenomenal number. Tell us a little bit about that, because obviously that's how people get into the prison system to begin with. Sure. 
Uh, mass incarceration is a tremendous problem here in America. Are you guys aware of it? I mean, when I started about eight years ago, it was less, it was less in the press. Mass incarceration is becoming um, more and more, uh, or the thought of it and the need to change it is becoming more and more prevalent. But if you, if you look at the statistics, statistics, excuse me, they're horrifying. There's 2.1 million people in prison every single day. Okay, so one out of every 100 people, adults, right, adult statistics, one out of every 100 people, so do the math in this room, is incarcerated. There's actually one out of every 30 people in America is under some form of correctional supervision. Okay, so incarcerated parole or probation. Um, the statistics are skewed massively, okay, in relation to, um, you know, blacks and Hispanics. Okay, I, I was talking with a pastor earlier on. You know, the, the America incarcerates a larger percentage of its black male population than South Africa did during apartheid. Okay, so we shut South Africa down, right? They didn't go to the Olympics. We embargoed them until they squealed and then they gave up, okay? But yet here we are uh, doing the same thing. Um, so, you know, America is all about, um, actually, on any given day, I read the statistic the other day, on any given day, a, a, a normal person in America commits three felonies. You guys aware of that? We're all one step away from being arrested. <laughs> All right, so think about that as you go out in your day. But unfortunately, the system's not working. The, the America spends $82 billion a year on incarceration and has a 67% recidivism rate. Okay, recidivism rate is the failure rate. So within 67% of all men and women that are released from prison will be rearrested within three years. And of that percentage, 50% of them will be reincarcerated. Okay, so 30%, more or less, 30% of people released from prison will be reincarcerated every single year. 16,000 men and women are released out of prison into Manhattan alone every single year without any housing, without any jobs, without any ability to succeed. So what do you think the success, you know, why the success factor is what it is? So anyway, so those are some of the statistics. So with that number of people going into the prison, it seems like it makes a lot of sense. You want to do what you can so that when they come out of prison, they've got different options, which is why your ministry is so critically important. So talk to us a little bit about what your ministry looks like. So you, you go in to Rikers Island, what do you do there? Sure, so look, it's a massive problem, so you really need to think about how you can address things you know, as holistically as possible. So we've got 14 um, men and women that are on our in-prison um, you know, ministry team. And we do, you know, we do standard church services, okay? We go in and we preach the gospel, we carry Jesus, we bring the light. You know, and, and a small light shines very brightly in a dark place. So, you know, we were received very, very um, uh, favorably by, by the, both the inmates and, and correction. But we're in four of the ten facilities on Rikers Island. Our goal is to be in all ten of them. We do midweek services. We also do Sunday Bible study. Um, we do Friday morning mentoring, one-on-one, uh, -on -one at both the men's and the women's facility. Um, men and women that are about to get out, where are you with Christ? Where are you with your relationship with your family? Where are you with forgiveness? That's a, that's a big one. Yeah. Right? Where, where are you with forgiveness? And, and then the more practical stuff, what are you doing when you get out? Okay, do you have a job? Do you have a resume? Do you have ID? Where are you going? Um, it's, it's, a, it's a serious problem. Um, so we're doing that in prison. We developed a, a correspondence Bible study course. So we didn't want to just preach the gospel and say, good luck, and we'll see you in, in a month, because it takes more than that, right? Um, it's, it, we, we try to be relational. We know the men and women. I remember the first time somebody came up to me and said, oh, you know, Michael, you know, X, Y, Z. And I said, oh, hey, Linwood, how you doing? I said, you know my name? You know, it was just like fascinating to him. You know my name? So it's relational. Um, we have a correspondence Bible study course, putting them into the, into the Bible. And it's, you know, it's, it's Christ, Christian 101 um, type stuff. Um, we give them lesson number one. They leave. They send it back to us. We send them lesson number two. Um, and so on, and it's an evergreen series because Rikers Island is so transient, and so many men go upstate, so many men um, and women go home. Um, so we've had over you know 800 men and women participate in the Bible study program. Um, they get their their families involved in it. They send it to their parents. They send it to their spouses. They have us send certificates to their mothers. Say, please send my certificate to my mother because I want to show her that I actually accomplished something. Yeah. Um, we every six lessons we provide a certificate. And at first, I was wrestling with our founder saying, why are we wasting time and money on a certificate? Um, but when you see a 50-year-old man who's never accomplished anything in his life receive a certificate and ask you to send it to his mom or his kids, 
You yeah. know, it's, it's a big deal. And then we spend a lot of time through correspondence, right? We walk with them. Um, you know, the ideal is if we meet them on Rikers Island, we minister to them there, they get involved in our Bible study program, they go upstate, we continue to write with them, we continue to dialogue with them, we send them cards, we send them newsletters, we send them, um, you know, birthday and holiday cards, we write letters and speak life, speak Jesus. They come out, then we help them find a job, we help them find housing. We help them meet whatever needs. We provide food. We provide clothing. So we're doing a lot in prison. We're expanding more and more to do um, reentry services. You know, because I sat down with a, a man on one Friday morning. And I said, you know, you're getting out on, mo on Monday. Aren't you really excited? And he said, no, I couldn't be more afraid. Mm -hmm. I have no place to go. No. I got no family. I have no money. How long do you think it's going to be before I commit a crime and end up back here? And it's desperate. And somebody has, to, somebody has to step in, right? Somebody has to step in and, and meet their needs. Somebody has to um, reach God's people. So these are the people that God has given us to reach. And like I said, I, I thank them every day. Yeah. Let's just uh, tell Michael how much we appreciate his willingness to do that ministry. <laughs> uh, just so you know, um, uh, if there's something you would like to contribute towards this ministry today, you are welcome to do that. Uh, you can mark on, if you just mark on the memo line of your check or on the envelope, prison, we'll know what that's for. We'll make sure it gets uh, sent to that ministry. Also, if you're doing your giving online, we actually have a line item that says reach out and touch prison ministry, and uh, you can uh, select that and uh, contribute that way. But uh, I'd like us to uh, pray for Michael today before... Uh, uh, before we're done, all right? Let's just bow in prayer. Uh, Father, we're so grateful that um, he heard your voice and understood your call. And even though he was afraid and he cried and the roof, uh, the, his tongue stuck to the roof of his mouth, he still walked towards the doors. And when he touched them, he found an entire dimension of life he didn't know existed. And not only did it help him make a difference in their lives, it made a difference in his life, and it's made a difference in his family's life. We are so grateful that when we follow your purpose in our lives, that's what you do. And we ask that you would use Michael over and over again, person after person in this ministry, and that there would be multi-generational testimonies of men whose sons and daughters have a very different story because Michael's organization intercepted their life. We ask for your grace to be on him and your provision to flow into his life and ministry. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, Michael. Thank you. So the good news for you is uh, you get a very short message from me. Here's what I want us to start with this morning, and that is this. This does not seem to, there we go. Nothing should disqualify a person from hearing the good news. The good news is not just good news for good people. The good news is good news for everyone, and especially those who need to hear it the most. I don't know about you, but when I go shopping, I'm on a mission. I do not go to the grocery store to taste whatever samples they have out. I do not go to meet with friends or to buy a cup of coffee and sit and observe the general population. I do not go to browse to see what new products they may have put on the shelf since the last time I was there. I go for a single purpose. I go to obtain the five things my wife texted me and told me to bring home and then I'm going to get out of there. That's why when you have walked by me in the grocery store, I don't even notice you. you nobody exists. I'm just on my way to get what it is. When I'm in a store, I have a mission. I know why I'm there. Well, the church has a mission. So do you know why you are here? Because if we don't know that, we're going to wind up wasting a lot of our time, a lot of our lives, and a lot of our resources. Jesus had a phenomenal conversation with a young woman from Samaria. 
and the conversation ends with her life being transformed and the disciples being confused as to why Jesus would have this conversation at all. And this is what Jesus says. He says, don't you have a saying? It's still four months until the harvest. I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields for they are ripe for harvest. There's this assumption that people really aren't all that interested in grace or God or spiritual things. And the simple truth is that could not be further from the truth. Jesus started this conversation with a Samaritan woman, and I can't tell you how unlikely or unusual that was. Given the religious and ethnic tribe that Jesus was born into, this conversation should never have taken place. The Bible tells us that the Jews had no dealings with the Samaritans, and the Samaritans had no dealings with the Jews, and there were lots of good reasons for that. You could start with political reasons. Israel used to be a united country, and at one point they divided the northern from the southern tribe. They became a, a civil war in the nation, and, and one tribe that divided uh, developed their own kingdom and initiated their own king, and that was the Samaritans. That's who they were. They politically divided the nation, and then on top of that, they incorporated a lot of the practices of the indigenous tribes around them into their worship, so a lot of pagan idolatry wound its way being part of their worship, and they built their own temple in Mount Gerizim. They didn't recognize the temple in Mount Zion. On top of that, they married people who were not part of their ethnic group. So in the eyes of the Jews, they were diluting the race. And on top of that, when Israel came out of Babylonian captivity and came back to, to Jerusalem to rebuild the city and to rebuild the worship house that was there, the temple that was there, they were highly opposed by a group of people. Does anyone care to guess who that group of people might have been? That's right. It was the Samaritans. And on top of that, they only accepted the first five books of the Old Testament as being authentic scripture. All other Jewish poets, all other Jewish prophets, they ripped the pages out and they eliminated them from their teaching and instruction. To say that these two groups did not get along would be an incredible understatement. They hated each other. No self-respecting Jew would ever have a conversation with a Samaritan, and no self-respecting Samaritan would ever speak to a Jew. But Jesus was on a very different mission. He was not here to prove that one group was right and another group was wrong. Jesus came to seek and to save those who were lost. And as it turns out, there are lost in every people group on the face of the planet. The conversation that Jesus had with this woman actually transformed her life. He covered uncomfortable topics. They were discussed openly, and he was able to speak truth without condemnation, which is not an easy thing to do. And Jesus, when he was done speaking with her, she wound up leaving her water jar, which is why she had come, just to go tell a bunch of other people that she had met someone that changed her life, and maybe he could change their lives too. So how could we become a person who influences other people towards grace? Because this is what you should know. This is not just the mission of the Son of God. This is the mission of all the children of God. Every son and every daughter. We're all called to be active participants in extending the grace of God in the world around us. So here's some, some takeaways from our talk today. The first is you cannot tell what work God is doing in a person's heart. You can't tell by looking at them what God is doing in their heart. You might assume that they're disinterested or that they might even be oppositional, but you can't tell. I had a college roommate who the only way he could save face and get biblical information was to argue against it. So every Thursday night, he would argue with me. We would first go down to the student union and play ping pong, and then we would go get a snack and play chess. I only beat him one time in the entire semester in a game of chess. He was a very good chess player. And then we would debate, and he would, he would start arguments about biblical things. And, you know, I, I would want to say, if you don't want to be a Christian, don't be a Christian. Leave me alone. But no, he just kept asking questions and arguing. And I realized this was a safe way for him to get information without looking like he was interested. One night I was reading my Bible before I turned out the light. I would do that every night. I'd read a passage of scripture before I turned out the light. And he said, what are you reading? One night he says, what are you reading? 
I said, I'm reading the Bible. He said, I know that. He said, what, what, is it, what is the verse you're reading right now say? And I said, you don't want to know. He said, oh, yes, I do. I said, no, you don't. You do not want to know what verse I'm reading right now. He said, yes, I do. I said, the verse I'm reading right now says, the fool has said in his heart there is no God. And he did not believe me. He got up, walked across the room, took the Bible out of my hands and looked at it, and that is what it said. And before the semester was over, Clifford Chi Khan Lee became a fully devoted follower of Jesus. That's what happens. You have no way of knowing what work God is doing in a person's heart. You can't tell what's going on on the inside just by looking at the outside. So we have to be willing to have those conversations. The second thing is you cannot make a difference from a distance. You cannot make a difference from a distance. Jesus initiated the conversation with this Samaritan wo woman. He wasn't afraid that her religion was going to contaminate him. He wasn't concerned about what his friends and followers were would think of him. He was on a mission. Seek and save those who are lost. The easiest way, the easiest way to start a conversation is with a question. With a question. The easiest way to start an argument is with a statement. But if you want to start a conversation, start with a question. And he started that conversation with a question. When I was in India on a uh, missions trip, I came across some missionaries who were responsible for discipling people who are oral learners. And that just fascinated me. I said, how do, you how do you disciple people when they cannot read and they cannot write? Because so much of what we do is we point them to books and we point them to scripture. And, and like even Michael said this morning, they have correspondence courses. What do you do with a person who can't read and can't write? And they said, what we do is we tell them the Bible stories, and there are between 600 and 800 Bible stories depending on how you define a story in Scripture. And so they took a group of pastors at the, in Hyderabad, where we were in India, and they trained us all how to tell a story from the Bible, and then they sent us out into all the tea shops and the coffee shops and public places, and they said, this is what we want you to do. We want you to go up to complete strangers, and we want you to start the conversation like this. I heard a really interesting story today. Would you like to hear it? And then if they say yes, tell them the story, and when the story is done, say, that was the story I heard. What did you think of the story? That was the assignment. The next morning, all of those pastors came in more excited than I've ever seen any group of pastors in my life. And the reason was because when they asked people, do you want to hear the story, they almost always said yes. And when they finished the story and they asked, what did you think about that story, it opened up all kinds of conversation for, about spiritual things. And then on top of that, almost all of those individuals said, if you hear another story tomorrow, would you come back and tell me that story too? See, people really are interested. It's amazing what you can do with a question. I was giving a ride to a person who was an atheist, and he knew I was a pastor, and so he made it very clear, because people will make clear. They said, I just want you to know, I'm an atheist. So don't you try to convert me. And so I just, uh, that, I don't know why I thought of this. The Holy Spirit was helping me. I just said, oh, that's really interesting. I said, I, I, I know how I came to be a believer. I know what questions I had to ask. I know what information I had to get and find and, and seek and, and process. I'm just wondering, how did you come to be an atheist? And so they started to talk. We had a long ride. I was giving a long ride. He started to talk, and he told me, started explaining why he was an atheist, and it dawned on him in the middle of the conversation that the only reason he was an atheist is because his father was an atheist, and he had just been raised to be an atheist. And so I just said, well, you know, is that good enough for you? Just because your father was an atheist, is that enough for you, or would you like some additional information? He said, well, I'm, I'm willing to, to learn, and I said, all right. I gave him a book. He wound up reading that book. He wound up making a commitment to Christ. He actually comes back to the Rochester area a couple of times a year, and every time he does, he always visits our church on a Sunday, and he sits right over there on the far side, and one of my favorite sights is to see this guy whose first words out of his mouth was, I want you to know I'm an atheist. I love watching that guy with his hands up in the air worshiping God. And it's not because, it's not because I won. It's because grace transforms people's lives. That's the point. 
We cannot make a difference if we keep our distance. We have to be willing to move closer. We have to be willing to ask questions. Last point, you cannot rush spiritual birth. You cannot rush spiritual birth. My daughter is seven months pregnant. She walks to work on most days. It's about a 20-minute walk. So about halfway along the way, she realized she needed a restroom. For all of you women who have been pregnant, you know that the frequency of that need increases over the course of the pregnancy. So she walked into a coffee shop, and she said, can I use your restroom? And the owner of the coffee shop said, our restrooms are only for our customers. And she said, I am seven months pregnant. And he said, here's the key, and just <laughs> let her go right in. But while she is seven months pregnant, none of us want that baby to be born today. You cannot rush the process. Any woman who's been pregnant knows it'd be great to schedule it on the exact day and time that you want, but that almost never happens. A baby that comes too early can have complications that put its survival at risk. And we can cause a spiritual abortion by forcing a person to make a commitment to Christ before they are ready. We feel like we've only got one option, one conversation, one small bit of time. And what I want you to know is time is the one gift we can give people. Because Jesus said this. He said, if you're going to consider my claims on your life, and you're going to consider my claims of who I am, you need to think it through thoroughly, and you need to count the cost. And if that takes a little bit of time, then that is time well spent. And so one of the things we do around here, we give people a gift of time. If you're here today and you are not a believer in Christ and you are not ready to make that decision, we will not force you to make it today. You can come back next week. And if you keep learning things and get to the place where you're ready to make that decision, we will support that and embrace that 100%. Does that make sense to anybody? Yeah. All right. All right. You don't sound convinced. <laughs> Maybe it's the lack of hour thing. Maybe you're worried about getting out on time. If I were you, I would worry now, too, because of your lack of response, I have to go longer. It's just how it is. So you've probably heard lots of spiritual leaders say this. If you were to die tonight, if you were to get hit by a bus, because evidently runaway buses are rampant in our world. You know, maybe back in the, in, the, in the Bible, they would say, if you were to get hit by a chariot, you know, but... If you were to get hit by a bus, do you know where you would spend eternity? And that's not the question I ask people. You're probably going to live today and tomorrow and another day too. Why would you want to live that apart from the wisest, most loving being in the entire universe who has nothing other than your best intention at his heart? Why would you not want to experience his grace each and every day of your life? And I think those kinds of conversations make all the difference. You cannot rush spiritual birth. They recently televised the funeral service of Billy Graham. What an amazing individual he has been. His integrity and capacity to reach people for Christ is unparalleled in Christian human history. But what I want you to know is that there are lots of people who would never listen to Billy Graham. They would change the channel if they saw him on TV, and they would decline an invitation to go hear him in person. But they will listen to you if you're willing to move beyond your assumptions and close some distance and start a conversation. The work that God does in your own heart is an incredibly personal thing. Good news isn't good news if it's not personal, if it doesn't matter to you. It's only good news if it affects you personally. But because it is personal is why it is good news, but that doesn't mean it's private. We take that incredible personal work that God has done in our hearts and we share it with others because that is how the grace of God expands in our world. Let's bow our heads this morning. Um, I can't promise you that every conversation ends with a conversion. I can't promise you that everyone will act open and interested, but I can promise you that your life dramatically changes, dramatically changes, if you are open to the possibility of extending God's grace to other people, if you're willing to get close to people you'd rather avoid, start conversations with questions and see where God's direction and Holy Spirit can take it. And what I can tell you is, it doesn't just change their life. 
changes your life too. You begin to get a sense of why you're here. And it's not just to have an easier life. It's to have a life of influence in our world. That grace is greater than sin and life is greater than death. And God's salvation is greater than any crime that's ever been committed. His healing is greater than any sickness that's ever been manifested in humanity. And if we're willing to be agents of his kingdom, if we're willing to start conversations, it makes all the difference in the world. So, Father, help us today. Help us to be people who are willing to start a conversation, to close the distance, to not assume that you're not already at work in their life. And let's see what you do. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together this morning.